It's seven o'clock, and this is the work session of Wednesday, April the 1st, at 2015. Uh, the first item we're going to do, since Christy Lee's here, is we're going to ask Marty to give us a presentation on the 4th of July awards and fireworks. Marty? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you should have a memo before you dated March 26th. The subject is a recommendation to award a contract for the city's 4th of July celebration fireworks. As most, if not all of you are probably aware, we've been dealing with uh, fireworks productions ever since um, ever since the fireworks started in 19, <laughs> well, restarted in 1978. Um, we uh, recently have started to formalize our relationship with them through co a contract. Uh, the first contract that was awarded um, expired in July of 2014. And in an effort to uh, secure another contract, uh, the uh, fireworks subcommittee of the 4th of July Celebration Committee uh, <clears throat> basically beat the pavement to try and determine uh, uh, what pricing they could get from other uh, fireworks supply companies. Um, most of them are, are, for the most part, uh, fairly close in their pricing. However, uh, one big issue we have with uh, uh, fireworks productions is they're about the only one in the state of Maryland that will allow our licensed and certified uh, shooters participate. Uh, and if you've ever been involved in uh, or seen the operations of the shoot itself, it's very important for us uh, in the way that we structure our celebration that we have control of the event. <clears throat> and having our shooters in there uh, gives us the control that we need to uh, maintain safety. Um, based on that and um, the fact that Fireworks Productions is willing to extend uh, their pricing for an additional three years, we're recommending that the Mayor and City Council award a three-year contract uh, to Fireworks Productions of Maryland Line, Maryland uh, for uh, $35,000. Um, the city's contribution for this event is $9,500. Uh, based on the budget, the existing budget that the 4th of July Celebration, Celebration Committee has, uh, that will leave us a contingency of $7,000, which we feel is more than enough to cover any uh, unanticipated cost for this year's event. Take any questions you may have. Thank you, Marty. I appreciate it. Chris, do you want to add anything else to it? No, that's about right. That's the next. Okay. Jim, do you have anything to add? No. All right. Council, start with uh, Ms. Query. I'm fine with this. Mr. Liss. I'm fine. Ms. Nicholas. Yes, sir. Mayor. I don't have a vote. I'm okay. I know you don't have a vote. You have a say. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much, Marty. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. We'll go back to the regular agenda. And we have uh, ordinance number 1839, an ordinance to modify the operation of the City of Laurel Police Retirement Plan, effective on after July the 1st of 2015, to reduce the, author the amortization period. Mr. Green. Yes, sir. If I can speak briefly on the this and the next three items. Uh, at their meeting on February 4th of this year, the Board of Trustees uh, heard recommendations from Bolton Partners, the actuary for the city, on two actuarial assumption changes that would affect the operation of the plans and the city's contribution to the plans. <clears throat> they were, one, to change the amortization period used in both plans, and two, to adopt an updated mortality table in both plans. At the meeting, the board voted to recommend that the mayor and city council approve these changes, and the pending legislation was forwarded to the FOP, and their president responded that he had no issues with the changes. Regarding the first item before you, uh, which is the amortization, right. Uh, the amortization period is a time period that the plan has to pay off impacts to the plan's liabilities. 
including plan changes, assumption changes, and actuarial losses and gains. Bolton has indicated that this change would decrease the city's contribution for 2015 by about $20,000. Currently, the police plan has an uh, amortization period of 25 years, and they are proposing that we change it to 20. The reduction seems to be in the interest that we won't be paying. We'll be paying, it's like a mortgage. You're going to be paying it off sooner, so you pay less interest over the, over the long haul. Okay. So that's the first one before you. Okay. Council, any questions? Ms. Query? I would like to save you money. Mr. Liss. Mike, get your mic. I'm sorry. So they suggested that the amortization period be decreased. This is, in fact, decreasing the amortization period. Right. I don't know if this is the last oh, yeah. step, but they are proposing, the actuary is proposing right now. Yeah, to, I think they're abiding by their association's recommendations. They are very active in the association. Okay, excellent. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Nicholas? Mr. Smalls. I'm okay with this. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Green. Would you move on to ordinance number 1840, an ordinance to modify the operation of the City of Laurel Employees Retirement Plan, effective after July 1st of 2015, and to reduce the amortization period. Uh, again, it's this, the same idea with the employee plan, except we're going from a 30-year amortization period to 20. <clears throat> and again, it would play into that $20,000 savings. Any questions from the council? Seeing none, we'll move on, Mr. Green, to item number three, ordinance number 1841, an ordinance to amend the operation of the City of Laurel Police Retirement Plan, effective on or after, on and after July 1st of 2015, by changing the mortality table used for the funding purposes. Mr. Green. These two are actually identical. Well, then let me read uh, 1842. Ordinance number 1842, an ordinance to amend the operating of the, the operation of the City of Law Employees Retirement Plan, effective on or after July 1st, 2015, by changing the mortality table used for the funding purposes. Okay. Mortality tables are used to project the expected life of participants, retirees, and their beneficiaries. We have been taking incremental steps towards achieving this particular generational table. And this would be the last step in, it. well, it would be the last step in achieving this one. It's our understanding that a new table has come out in late fall of 2014. But it's not been widely adopted yet. And for now, we are going with the, what is it, 2009? 2000, uh, with the generational scale, double uh, A. Questions for the council? Mr. Green, I'm, yes. I'm sorry, I was kind of fumbling around here, but would you tell us again why we're not going with the more current one, or tell me? It has not been that. widely adopted. We, I expect that we will eventually, probably mm -hmm. in the next year or at most two. But this is a generational table. It, it goes out beyond mm -hmm. uh, the 2000 year. Okay. All right. Any other questions from the council? Thank you, Mr. Green. Move on to resolution number 6-15, a resolution of the Mayor and City Council of Laurel, Maryland, declaring a temporary moratorium regarding the processing of zoning matters within the City of Laurel, Maryland. Mayor Mo. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm going uh, to just lead off. Um, we've been talking about uh, the administration for some time, and we've been uh, announcing it that it's probably uh, that time, again, to put the temporary moratorium in place to allow staff the opportunity to um, do what is required under the law. And that is the master plan needs to be updated. Our growth plan needs to be updated. We need to get citizen involvement. There needs to be a citizens group as well as participation from planning commission and, and all of the CACs. Uh, this is the, the first stab at it and wanted to get some input, but I think um, the longer we wait, the, the more time um, they're gonna need from the staff standpoint because they're doing other things that, and this will just give them some free, free time. So, Jack. 
Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. President, what is before you is resolution number 6-15. The master plan was adopted by mayor and city council in 1989. It was amended in 97, 07, and 09. Uh, the current edition is uh, only on seven years old, so the data in it is from the 2000 uh, census. So uh, what this moratorium would do would allow staff the time to go back and update the, the master plan, uh, meet with the citizens advisory committee that the mayor will name, uh, go through the planning process, the reviews uh, and public hearings in order to uh, get up to speed. Uh, what this does is the department would not process zoning requests, special exceptions, or tax amendments during the review process as it could be affected by the changes that would be made in the master plan. <coughs> one thing. Go ahead, sir. Just uh, one other thing. We did put uh, 18 months. It really, as I said earlier, could be up to 18 months. We wanted to just put that <coughs> flexibility in there, whether it takes that amount of time. Uh, we don't know, but this is from previous uh, history of dealing with this. And many of y'all up here before have been involved with the process for, uh, in the past as well. And the okay. effective date would be 1 July 2015. I remember the last time we did it, and it did take quite a bit of staff time to brief us on some of the issues, and so I appreciate the 18 months. Mr. Smalls. <laughs> Mr. Brock, how many projects are currently in our pipeline that would not be affected by this moratorium that your staff would have to continue to, to process generally? I think all of them that are in the pipeline would move forward. Which is why we looked would, at the data. All of them, I'm sorry, would do all of, all of those that we have in would move forward. They would not be affected by the moratorium. Right, and I'm asking how and, many of those projects are there? Just a rough number probably six to eight. Okay. But we would accept those applications up to uh, June 30th. So they would continue in the process to be approved or modified and approved. And then at 1 July, then we would start uh, going into the master plan, working pretty much full time on that. <coughs> Bless you. And the 1 July date is that the effective date of the moratorium? Yes, sir. So any applications that come from tomorrow to June 30 would add to your would be current processed. workload? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. All right. yeah, let me, I'm going to, let me just, we're not going to have a floodgate open up. Oh, We've no, had no. this in the past. Right. We're going to talk right. about this internally and make sure that that July 1 is the fair date, but we want to start getting that out. It might be May. Yeah, it could be June. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I, I just want to look at that yeah, before we do that because what happens is it all floods in and I, we're not going to get into that. This is to help um, the staff and the council and all the other departments that have to deal with this process. Mm -hmm. So, Ms. Nicholas. No question. Mr. Liz. Thank you, Mr. President. I was involved in the 89 and the 97 efforts and the issue is not just the staff time you got planning commission time you got your your hearings i mean there's a lot of work that goes into this and to echo what the mayor said um, what you don't want is you don't want what, ha what has happened in howard county before where something got started and then sat for five years and nothing happened on the project okay so this is a good approach and i applaud the mayor and the administration for getting a head start on this so we can get this done timely. And to be honest with you, we're at a loss without Carl. Because Carl was involved in at least three of these efforts. And there's a lot of institutional knowledge that uh, will lift him to a better place. But again, I know the staff will do a good job. But at, at times, when I was on the planning commission, it was almost overwhelming. And uh, so I wish you good luck. Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Query. I'm fine at this time. Well, I, I think it's a Herculean uh, uh, job for all of us to, to get into, but I think it's healthy for the city 
to step back and take a look at all the things we're doing and make sure that um, that we're meeting our objectives in a healthy way. And I totally agree with it. All right, we're going to move on. Are there any other questions from council? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move on to a consideration of recommendation to award a contract for the purchase of police mobile data computers. Mr. Frost. Good evening, Mr. President, Mayor, Council Members. Um, IT in coordination with the police department are in the process of um, adding 20 additional mobile computers to our patrol staff. Um, right now, and, and probably for the last almost seven years, uh, officers have been swapping uh, computers as they come on and off shifts. Some recent technology changes has created some issues with this, um, particularly in, in the docks that we're using. We have to upgrade our docks, and they're going to dual pass-through docks now. We have single pass-through docks. Um, that discussion and the fact that when we initially started this, we had uh, nothing but a GPS in the car, and now, since then, we have added uh, the ETEX machine, which is a total piece of technology with a printer. We now have the arbitrator in-car camera system um, that is now connected through a Wi-Fi connection to the PD, which has added some more antennas on the back. Um, so the combination of all the technology, the docs changing, and the fact we're swapping computers has created some, some problems for IT and the officers. Um, and for one example, um, in the ETIC scenario, if an officer uses a computer and puts that in the shelf on the rack, comes back the next day, somebody else has it, um, their uh, transaction the day before is on that computer. They would have to track down that, uh, that computer. Um, so um, this, this uh, recommendation is to purchase uh, 20 new mobile um, rugged computers. Um, it, it, it is with Breckford out of Hanover. It is on the state contract, and we'll be using uh, speed enforcement funds to do that. Thank you, sir. Questions? Ms. Query? I just saw a piece recently, and I'm always concerned about the officer's attention and how much they've got going on in that front cab. Uh, is there any effort to streamline or move it to the passenger seat? Or, I don't know, maybe it's more of a question for the chief. Yeah, I think the technology, where, so where it is, um, is pretty standard nationwide, the way yeah. it's configured. And the chief can jump in as far as the, um, the situational awareness and, and everything they have going on there. Um, but that configuration is, is pretty standard. I just don't want to make their job more difficult. And as soon as you say printer, like, you know, there's so many things in the front seat. That's all. Mr. Les. Anticipating one of my uh, neighbors saying to me, why are we spending $5,000 on a computer? These are ruggedized and hardened, is that correct? They're ruggedized, uh, they're hardened. Um, they have uh, special uh, keyboards to be mm -hmm. seen at night. Right. Um, they are you can't spill a can of soda on them and have them fry themselves. Um, and, and it's a special high intensity uh, display high for during the daylight for sunlight. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Nicholas. How was this vendor selected? This is the state contract vendor. State contract. Yeah, they are the only vendor on the state contract for this for this computer. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smalls. I'm fine with this, Mr. President. Thank you. Item number seven, consideration of the recommendation to purchase computer software. Frost. Mr. President, this, this is in direct relationship to the computers. <clears throat> to use the computers, we have to now add our law enforcement software. Our, our vendor is SunGuard Public Sector. They've been our vendor for the last seven years. So what uh, this proposal is, is to add 20 um, uh, mobile licensing um, so that they can connect back to our CAD system, they can connect to uh, Miles and NCIC and do the things that they got to do, um, and this software allows that. And this will be a, a sole source vendor to SunGuard Public Sector as they are the uh, proprietary uh, software company. And this also will be speed camera funds. Any questions from the council? Thank you, Mr. Frost. 
Consideration of a recommendation to award a contract for telecommunications fiber construction to Fiber Plus Inc. of Jessup, Maryland. Mr. Frost. Mr. President, this is a uh, part of our park security initiative that was started last year. Um, we did, uh, we added cameras in parks last year, and unfortunately the, the easy um, work has been done, and, and now we're having to um, uh, get a little more intensive in, in what we're doing. So what this proposal does is take um, from the Robert J. DiPietro Community Center, it will run telecommunications fiber underground in conduit uh, down Cypress behind the uh, shopping center. It will cross Cypress, come down the path at the lake house, and we'll connect into the lake house. Um, that will get us onto our network, uh, which will allow us then to um, put city citywide phone system in that building and take it off a landline. It will allow us to uh, put a new security system in that building on our system. It will allow us to put cameras in the park, and it will also um, enable us to do a Wi-Fi initiative in the park. Okay. Questions from council. Mr. Frost, you know if you said Wi-Fi in the park. First question I'm going to ask is which park? Laurel Lake. Laurel Lake. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Goody, Frost. Goody Park. Thanks, Mike. I got all the parks in my head. <laughs> it, it's synonymous. Let me be. <laughs> all these issues will come up at our meeting on Monday, <laughs> April the 13th at 7 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Frost. <laughs> Ordinance number 1846, an ordinance to amend certain projects' budgets in the 20, FY 2015 through FY 2020 capital improvements program. Ms. Saylor. Good evening. Uh, this ordinance takes money that was previously authorized for Cherry Lane improvements and um, places it in the Ashford Place improvement project, the Ashford Court improvement project as well as Laurel Place improvements. Um, I'm sorry, also moving money from that has accumulated in a street repairs and safety improvement program project, um, pairing it with the Cherry Lane. Um, Mr. Furry could speak more to this, but um, at this time we're still, de still dealing with Prince George's County on the stormwater um, drain that's running under Cherry Lane. So at this time, we're not going to be able to move forward with that project. So we'd just like to reallocate the funds to projects that can currently move forward. Questions from the council? Seeing none, this will be on our agenda for April the 13th at 7 p.m. as well. Ordinance... Uh, Number 1837, map amendment number 847, an ordinance to approve map amendment application number 847 for rezoning a property known as Sandy Spring Village located at 312 Sandy Spring Road, Laurel, Maryland, consisting of 1.44 acres identified as Laurel Subdivision Block 3, Lot 20, tax parcel 1033588, owned by Ross Phillips and Calvin Growl, located on the south side of Sandy Spring Road between Philip Powers Drive and Montgomery Street, from the R18 medium density multifamily to R20 one family semi-detached, two family detached, and one family triple attached. Mr. Brock, oh, Mike Robert's gonna do it. Yes, yes this rezoning, there's currently one single family detached house. Uh, there's a real estate sign on it uh, that you might have passed on Sandy Spring. And what Legend Builders would like to do is rezone that from a multi-family zone to a single, a semi-attached single family zone. Uh, the proposal is to construct five duplexes on the property in the rear. However, each half of the duplex will be on its own single lot record for single family ownership. Uh, and the, the existing house, uh, the planning department's recommending that the entire property be rezoned to an R20 zone uh, because it also will allow the existing single family house as a permitted land use. So it'll allow the proposed housing structure as well as the existing house, housing structure. 
Uh, the planning department sent out certified letters to neighbors, and uh, we've received one phone call. The neighbor would prefer that nothing be built there. Uh, so that was the comment. The sign has been posted. We've received one inner, uh, one department response for public works. There's be only one exit on the Sandy Spring, uh, just one driveway. The water and sewer department has stated that the rezoning will have a neg negligible effect on the water. The sewer, they sent over notice that a non-CIP size sewer extension is required to serve the property. An easement may be required and that downstream sewer improvements may be required for developments. This will be passed on to legend builders to give them a heads up of what may occur in the future. Uh, two things, one, this is the first step. If the property is rezoned, then a site plan will come through the process to be reviewed. And second, the planning department is going to recommend this to the planning commission. There has been a change in the character of the neighborhood. The east adjacent property has been rezoned for uh, East adjacent apartments have been demolished and they're starting to be constructed. The first phase, at least east adjacent, and then the apart existing apartments on Park Avenue and Phillips Power Drive will be removed and reconstructed in phases. And so the need for multifamily apartments, it's unlikely that the property will be developed as it's currently zoned for multifamily. And with the change in the neighborhood, the planning department's gonna recommend favor. Thank you. Ms. Query. Uh, in your opinion, and I guess we'll probably get to this later, is there gonna be a problem with the one driveway? And is that gonna end in above? And what about parking along at the width? And That's gonna be reviewed heavily by the departments. Um, yes, <laughs> during okay. the site plan phase. All Developer right. thinks they can work and Public works and we'll do that. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Liz. Let's repeat the phrase about the downstream sewer. Can you say something about maybe required? Yes. Who's that? The WSSC? That's correct. They need to get their act together. What are they going to tell this developer? He's got to improve the sewer down in Route 1. I mean, those are improvements that should have been done years ago by WSSC. I, and I, I ask that you advise me when you find out exactly what they want done. This is a trick they're playing all over developed areas of, within their jurisdiction. And they need to get on the gun with a plan that says how they're going to upgrade the sewer system, not have the developer that's putting five houses up here pay a million dollars to do something down in Route 1. Not the first time I've heard of this. I don't think it's the first time you've heard of it. Okay, so I'm telling you, WSSC needs to get their act together. And it's another example where they haven't been planning properly in their strategic plan. Don't, don't go after him, go after WSSC. Huh? Don't go after him, go after WSSC. No, no. no, what they do is they send it to the planning department and the developers. I appreciate that, but it's not his fault. Well, this is how we find out about it. I have a hearing down at WSSC. I'll go complain. Now, hold on a minute. I don't know who I complain to since the what's his name is going to be gone here. Miss Nicholas. Um, what did you say about parking? Um, well, that'll be reviewed during the site plan phase. Okay. But it's only a, an acre and a half. So that it's a small site. But the developer believes he can meet all of the regulations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Smalls. Robert, I know this is a map amendment. Um, and we're talking about things that are usually discussed during the site plan uh, process, but I'm going to join my colleagues and ask a question that's a site plan uh, related. You mentioned something about apartments versus these five duplex properties or uh, uh, homes. Who drew the conclusion that apartments on this lot wouldn't be appropriate. I mean, there, there are apartments going up around it. So I'm, I'm just, <clears throat> why, why has it been determined that rather than apartments, these duplexes, is it just to provide a, um, you know, a mix of uh, uh, residential offerings or, or is there some other 
No, Mr. Smoltz. I actually made the recommendation to Mr. Bra. Okay. On the, well, let me, with the amount of apartments being reconstructed next door. So you think it's too many apartments? I'm, I'm just, I'm just yeah. curious. I just thought that with the, the property would probably remain vacant and not be developed according to how it's zoned, uh -huh. which is for multifamily. Right. The amount of new units being constructed adjacent. And so okay. I just thought that if it's, we have a development that will come in, single family zone, um, single family ownership, it'll provide, uh, improve the surrounding uh -huh. property owners, it'll lower the density for the surrounding neighbors, be less neighbors, um, and it would benefit the immediate adjacent neighbors as well as the surrounding city. Sure. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm fine with this, but I was just curious when you made that statement as to what was driving that. Let me, I mean, you're, I think you're well aware, which is why you're asking. I mean, if you look at that neighborhood of that whole area, it has changed somewhat. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do think that a down zone of that property um, is in the best interest of the city, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and we're having parking issues up there. I think some of that will be relieved with the new parking the configuration mm -hmm. and the things that we've done working with that developer on the apartments. But it also gives us another, uh, uh, some more stock Right. Uh, housing right. stock, um, whether it's single family or others. And this brings us back to what we talked about earlier, the master plan. It is time to, for us to take a good hard look at things and to get input and make sure we're heading in the right direction as well. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Anything else from council? Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to item number 11 and ordinance uh, number 1843, map amendment number 848, an ordinance to approve map amendment application number 848, was rezoning of the property known as, as HSU property located at the southwestern corner of Conti Road and Van Dusen Road in Laurel, Maryland, consisting of 3.53 acres identified as tax parcel 1113034 owned by HSU and I'm going to spell it for the record SIU CHI revocable trust from a R5 one family detached to an MXT mixed use mixed use transportation oriented and we'll ask Mr. Brock well Robert's going to do it again okay thank you this property is located at the southwest corner of Conti and Van Dusen. It's the wooded property, and you'll recognize it because it's east, it's north adjacent of the assisted living development rezoning that uh, the council just heard. Um, what happened was the neighbor received a public notice letter about the assisted living, and so then the neighbor was interested in similarly rezoning his property from an R5 zone to an MXT zone. There's no planned development at this point. However, in the future, when he does have a plan, the concept plan will come back to you for concept plan approval, and then also then return to the planning commission for final approval. I'm still waiting word on agency response, specifically WSSC, but the planning department's gonna recommend this to the planning commission because it's consistent with our master plan, which recommends an MXD zone. Okay. Council, Ms. Nicholas. Mr. Liz. I'm fine with this. Ms. Query. I'm fine with this. Mr. Smoltz. I'm fine with this. <clears throat> Thank you, Robert. Ordinance number 1844, text amendment number 238, an ordinance to amend chapter 20, land development subdivision, article 1, zoning subdivision 1, in general section 20, title 20, Dash 1.7, definitions to amend and add definitions, division five, zoning, is, is this? No. Uh, division five, zoning district, section 20-7, commercial zones to amend table of commercial uses and division six, parking and loading facilities to amend section title 20-16.5, Schedule of parking requirements of the City of Laurel Code and providing an effective date. Mr. Brock. Mr. President, what is before you is a text amendment that would amend three sections of the Land Development Code, the first being definitions, 
that is to correct definitions that are currently in the land development code that are inconsistent with the definitions that are in the billing code that you will be hearing tonight. Uh, secondly, it would be amending the zoning districts to update some of those uses and to allow a lodging house as well as a rooming house uh, and to make some permitted uses special exceptions in order to give the Planning Commission the ability to review <clears throat> some uses uh, before being permitted. And then finally is parking and zoning facilities. That is a, a replacement of the entire section that is an update of the parking requirements uh, that would be of <clears throat> that would be in the city. Uh, this would be consistent with Prince George's County uh, and Howard County. And that, that concludes the, uh, the text amendment. Thank you. Mr. Smalls. I have no questions, Ms. Bergman. Ms. Nicholas. I'm fine. Mr. Liz. I'm fine. Ms. Query. I'm fine. Thank you, Mr. Brock. Number, item number 13. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mayor. John, he, before he starts reading the next one. I'm not going to read it. Why, why can't the title just be, we are updating the building code? Are we paying you guys by the word now again or what? <laughs> but unfortunately, since it was read into the record by the title in the last one, we got to do this on the second. I guess my point to y'all, and I'll instruct Christy to keep an eye out and Marty, the titles, I think we could do a preamble or something later, but the title, I just think that's a little bit too much. It really, it's confusing, and the bottom line is we are updating the, and Dave will speak to that, but we're updating the building code, quite frankly. So, and I sorry. checked earlier today and found out I didn't have to. I, unless you want to read the title, Dave. <laughs> Anyhow, item number 13 is uh, uh, the ordinance that I read at the last council meeting, and it's 1845, and I will read it at the next uh, council meeting on the 13th, but for now, would you speak to it, sir? Okay, Mayor, Mr. President, House members. This is, uh, we're mandated by the state to adopt all the codes. Uh, what you're actually in front of you is the adoption of all the codes and Chapter 18, which is the Laurel City Codes. And most of these are things that the city has stepped forward and put in the code that really aren't enforced elsewhere. And uh, so some of the changes in there are the 10 year smoke detectors that require the CO detectors. Retro, uh, retrofitting your house with the sprinkler system. And a couple of the big issues is a fire lane that we really never had a clear cut definition of a fire lane. And I spelled all that out to make sure it's clear cut for builders and developers and know that this is a city's requirement for the fire lanes. It basically gets an update of all the codes there and will be adopted. We're mandated by the state to adopt it in July. I'd just like to get them done early and get them over with. Okay. I think, just so you're aware, I talked to Dave. Um, the other day um, the reason we're trying to get ours done is so we can let people know what where we're going with things and development those types of things so he has the um, the authority under the uh, under the law to be a big flexible until it kicks in on the first so okay. miss query thank you sure. why do we have to go with an international pool and spa because there's a, uh, with every new, every swimming pool's come in or places do, there's a code that we have to adopt that because of certain requirements, we need ADA requirements, like pools have to have lifts in them, Remember have to be to bond bonded and grounded in a certain way, so we had to adopt it out of that code. Use that, use that ADA requirements. Donna's getting a spa, that's I, what she's trying to yeah, do. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, no, my focus was on the word international, that's what I was wondering, why? Come all up the, under codes there. Are, the, the codes are ICC, they're all international codes, but it's building code, residential codes. We just break it down and call them building codes, but it's international. All the codes are international. All right, so we're not adding an exotic pool or anything. Yeah, it's all, everything in there is international, what we're dealing with. Mr. Liz. I'm fine with this, Mr. President. Ms. Nicholas. Questions? Mr. Smalls. I'm good. They, they must have had a good time reading all this. We did. <laughs> yes, we do. Need something to put you to sleep, read it. Um, I just want to, you know, the fire commission 
um, the Maryland State Fire Commission does meet here. Dave goes to those meetings. Um, if you've never been to one, um, you know, you can let us know when the case council wants to stop by and see one. But um, all of it is geared towards uh, what Dave has, has showed us tonight, um, where uh, things that are appealed goes to the entire fire commission. Correct me if I'm wrong, to the entire fire commission. The nice thing about Laurel is you can take it to, to the fire marshal or then you can take it to the board of appeals and then is it go to court or does, can they go to the can they go to the state commission or not? That's right. no actually it's a fire related issue. It goes to the fire commission okay. first. If it's a question about a code, it goes to them first, but otherwise it stays local. Okay. Yeah. This is the other thing to add that we're probably the only jurisdiction in the state of Maryland that will probably meet the requirement. I'm not gonna say everybody, but we'll meet it by July. There's still a lot of jurisdictions out there. 2006 2009 because they're fighting the residential sprinkler so we are we've had that so it's not an issue with us. good thanks good work thank you thank you Dave. okay uh point of personal privilege here i have a couple of things i want to discuss with council uh number one is that as you all know we have expenses expense money in our account for each one of us and we don't really have a good guideline for how we spend that money and we've talked about it before and i'd like to with the council here um, you have in front of you a example of what we're thinking about doing and i who i mean we uh, miss query and and uh, miss rao and i got together and looked at how that could possibly happen so where you see council uh, council expense allowance there are two different, um, the one that's originally in yellow, and then the wordage that uh, Ms. Curry added to it. So if you could take a look at that, and let's have a, a little discussion as to how you all feel about this. I think the reasoning that we discussed when we were going over the language was in reality this is what we're doing in practice anyways is discussing it with each other as to what we want to use these funds for mr. small your thoughts um, <clears throat> quite honestly I, I I think it's like changing the word happy to glad I mean it already says what's highlighted in yellow and as uh, councilwoman McCrary mentioned it's our it's our practice any fu any future council if it remained the same uh, would still have to agree on uh, any expenditures that's just my opinion but I'm mr. Liz mr. president thank you I've, I've talked to you about this before my 19 years on the council I've seen certain council persons around the state get in trouble for expensing funds that they either didn't account for or they weren't spent on the right thing. So this is a good approach. Ms. Dickless? Yeah, I agree. I think this is good. Can I have a motion? You, you, you need a resolution. resolution. Did you get a resolution? You need a resolution? Absolutely. This okay. paper is done by resolution. Okay. Then we'll draft a resolution to do that. All right. The second thing that I've got personally, and I'd like to hear from the rest of the council is, I've run up on a problem with my campaign account, and the, I had it in PNC Bank. It was a small amount under a thousand dollars. Oh, oh wait, I didn't mean that. That, 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 that doesn't belong here. I'm sorry. This is that's election stuff. That does not belong up here like that. You need to see John or. Okay, can we the, meet with you afterwards? Yeah, that's where you need to send me a request. I've already sent it. And Karen said she was going to talk to you about it. Oh, okay. yeah. All right, I, I thought I could do it here. Okay, then we're adjourned.